Chapter 1.2 Biopolitical Production Quote, The police appears as an administration heading the state, together with the judiciary, the army, and the executor. True. Yet in fact, it embraces everything else. Torque says so. It branches out into all the people's conditions, everything they do or undertake. Its field comprises the judiciary, finance, and the army. The police includes everything. End quote from Michel Foucault. From the judicial perspective, we have been able to glimpse some of the elements of the ideal genesis of empire. But from that perspective alone, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to understand how the imperial machine is actually set in motion. Judicial concepts and judicial systems always refer to something other than themselves. Through the evolution and exercise of right, they point toward the material condition that defines their purchase on social reality. Our analysis must now descend to the level of that materiality and investigate there the material transformation of the paradigm of rule. We need to discover the means and forces of the production of social reality along with the subjectivities that animate it. Biopower in the Society of Control In many respects, the work of Michel Foucault has prepared the terrain for such an investigation from the material functioning of imperial rule. First of all, Foucault's work allows us to recognize a historical, epical passage in social forms from disciplinary society to the society of control. The disciplinary society is that society in which social command is constructed through a diffuse network of dispositifs, or apparatuses, that produce and regulate customs, habits, and productive practices. Putting the society to work and ensuring obedience to its rule and its mechanisms of inclusion and or exclusion are accomplished through disciplinary institutions, the prison, the factory, the asylum, the hospital, the university, the school, and so forth, that structure the social terrain and present logics adequate to the reason of discipline. Disciplinary power rules in effect by structuring the parameters and limits of thought and practice, sanctioning and prescribing normal and or deviant behaviors, Foucault generally refers to the ancient regime of the classical age of French civilization to illustrate the emergence of disciplinarity, but more generally, we could say that the entire first phase of capitalist accumulation in Europe and elsewhere was conducted under this paradigm of power. We should understand the society of control in contrast as that society, which develops at the far edge of modernity and opens toward the postmodern, in which mechanisms of command become ever more democratic ever more eminent to the social field, distributed throughout the brains and bodies of the citizens. The behaviors of social integration and exclusion proper to rule are thus increasingly interiorized within the subject themselves. Power is now exercised through machines that directly organize the brains, and communication systems, information networks, etc. The bodies and welfare systems, monitored activities, etc., toward a state of autonomous alienation from the sense of life and the desire for creativity. The society of control might thus be characterized by an intensification and generalization of the normalizing apparatus of disciplinarity that internally animate our common and daily practices. But in contrast to discipline, this control extends well outside the structured sites of social institutions through flexible and structuring networks. Second, Foucault's work allows us to recognize the biopolitical nature of the new paradigm of power. Biopower is a form of power that regulates social life from its interior, following it, interpreting it, absorbing it, and rearticulating it. Power can achieve an effective command of the entire life of the population only when it becomes an integral, vital function that every individual embraces and reactivates of his or her own accord. As Foucault says, Life has now become an object of power. The highest function of this power is to invest life through and through, and its primary task is to administer life. Biopower thus refers to a situation in which what is directly at stake in power is the production and reproduction of life itself. These two lines of Foucault's work dovetail with each other in the sense that only the society of control is able to adopt the biopolitical context as its exclusive terrain of reference. In the passage from disciplinary society to the society of control, a new paradigm of power is realized, which is defined by the technologies that recognize society as a realm of biopower.
in disciplinary society, the effects of biopolitical technologies were still partial in the sense that disciplining developed according to relatively closed geometrical and quantitative logics. Disciplinarity fixed individuals within institutions, but did not succeed in consuming them completely in the rhythm of productive practices and productive socialization. It did not reach the point of permeating entirely the consciousness and bodies of individuals, the point of treating and organizing them in the totality of their activities. In disciplinary society, then, the relationship between power and the individual remained a static one. The disciplinary invasion of power corresponded to the resistance of the individual. By contrast, when power becomes entirely biopolitical, the whole social body is comprised by power's machine and developed in its virtuality. This relationship is open, qualitative, and effective. Society, subsumed within a power that reaches down to the ganglia of the social structure and its processes of development, reacts like a single body. Power is thus expressed as a control that extends throughout the depths of the consciousness and bodies of the population, and at the same time, the entirety of social relations. In this passage from disciplinary society to the society of control, then, one could say that the increasingly intense relationship of mutual implication of all social forces that capitalism has poured throughout its development has now become fully realized. Marx recognized something similar in what he called the passage from the formal subsumption to the real subsumption of labor under capital. And later, the Frankfurt School philosophers analyzed a closely related passage of the subsumption of culture and social relations under the totalitarian figure of the state, or really within the perverse dialectic of enlightenment. The passage we are referring to, however, is fundamentally different in that instead of focusing on the indimensionality of the processes described by Marx and reformulated and extended by the Frankfurt School, the Foucauldian passage deals fundamentally with the paradox of plurality and multiplicity, and Deleuze and Guattari develop this perspective even more clearly. The analysis of the real subsumption, when this is understood as investing not only the economic or only the cultural dimension of society, but rather the social bios itself, and when it is attentive to the modalities of disciplinarity and or control, disrupts a linear and totalitarian figure of capitalist development. Civil society is absorbed in the state, but the consequence of this is an explosion of the elements that were previously coordinated and mediated in civil society. Resistances are no longer marginal, but active in the center of a society that opens up in networks. The individual points are singularized in a thousand plateaus. What Foucault constructed implicitly, and Deleuze and Guattari made explicit, is therefore the paradox of a power that, while it unifies and envelops within itself every element of social life, thus losing its capacity effectively to mediate different social forms, at that very moment reveals a new context, a new milieu of maximum plurality and uncontainable singularization, a milieu of the event. These conceptions of the society of control and biopower both describe central aspects of the concept of empire. The concept of empire is a framework in which the new omniversality of subjects has to be understood, and it is the end to which the new paradigm of power is leading. Here a veritable chasm opens up between the various old theoretical frameworks of international law and either its contractual and or UN form and the new reality of imperial law. All the intermediary elements of the process have in fact fallen aside so that the legitimacy of the international order can no longer be constructed through mediations, but must rather be grasped immediately in all its diversity. We have already acknowledged this fact from the judicial perspective. We saw, in effect, that when the new notion of right emerges in the context of globalization and presents itself as capable of treating the universal planetary sphere as a single, systemic set, it must assume an immediate prerequisite, acting in a state of exception, and an adequate plastic and constitutive technology, the techniques of the police. Even though the state of exception and police technologies constitute the solid nucleus and the central element of the new imperial right, however, this new regime has nothing to do with the judicial arts of dictatorship or totalitarianism that in other times, and with such great fanfare, were so thoroughly described by many, in fact, too many authors. On the contrary, the rule of law continues to play a central role in the context of the contemporary passage. Right remains effective, and 
precisely by the means of the state of exception and police techniques becomes procedure. This is a radical transformation that reveals the unmediated relationship between power and subjectivities, and hence demonstrates both the impossibility of prior mediations and the uncontainable temporal variability of the event. Throughout the unbounded global spaces to the depths of the biopolitical world and confronting an unforeseeable temporality, these are the determinations on which a new supranational right must be defined. Here is where the concept of empire must struggle to establish itself, where it must prove its effectiveness, and hence where the machine must be set in motion. From this point of view, the biopolitical context of the new paradigm is completely central to our analysis. This is what presents power with an alternative, not only between obedience and disobedience, or between formal political participation and refusal, but also along the entire range of life and death, wealth and poverty, production and social reproduction, and so forth. Given the great difficulties the new notion of right has in representing this dimension of the power of empire, and given its inability to touch biopower concretely in all its material aspects, imperial right can at best only partially represent the underlying design of a new constitution of world order. It cannot really grasp the motor that sets it in motion. Our analysis must focus its attention rather on the productive dimension of biopower. The production of life. The question of production in relation to biopower and the society of control, however, reveals a real weakness of the work of the authors from whom we have borrowed these notions. We should clarify, then, the vital or biopolitical dimensions of Foucault's work in relation to the dynamic of production. Foucault argued in several works in the mid-1970s that one cannot understand the passage from the sovereign state of the ancient regime to the modern disciplinary state without taking into account how the biopolitical context was progressively put at the service of capitalist accumulation. Quote, the control of society over individuals is not conducted only through consciousness or ideology, but also in the body and with the body. For a capitalist society, biopolitics is what is most important, the biological or somatic, the corporeal, end quote. One of the central objectives of his research strategy in this period was to go beyond the versions of historical materialism including several variants of Marxist theory, that consider the problem of power and social reproduction on a superstructural level, separate from the real base level of production. Foucault thus attempted to bring the problem of social reproduction and all the elements of the so-called superstructure back to within the material, fundamental structure and define this terrain not only in economic terms, but also in cultural, corporeal, and subjective ones. We can thus understand how Foucault's conception of the social whole was perfected and realized when, in a subsequent phase of his work, he uncovered the emerging outlines of the society of control as a figure of power active throughout the entire biopolitics of society. It does not seem, however, that Foucault, even when he powerfully grasped the biopolitical horizon of society and defined it as a field of imminence, ever succeeded in pulling his thought away from that structuralist epistemology that guided his research from the beginning. By structuralist epistemology here, we mean the reinvention of a functionalist analysis in the realm of the human sciences, a method that effectively sacrifices the dynamic of the system, the creative temporality of its movements, and the ontological substance of cultural and social reproduction. In fact, if at this point we were to ask Foucault who or what drives the system, or rather, who is the bios, his response would be ineffable, or nothing at all. What Foucault fails to grasp finally are the real dynamics of production in biopolitical society. By contrast, Deleuze and Guattari present us with a properly post-structuralist understanding of biopower that renews materialist thought and grounds itself solidly in the question of the production of social being. Their work demystifies structuralism and all the philosophical, sociological, and political conceptions that make the fixity of the epistemological frame an ineluctable point of reference. They focus our attention clearly on the ontological substance of social production, machines produce. The constant functioning of social machines and their various apparatuses and assemblages produces the world along with the subjects and objects that constitute it. Deleuze and Guattari, however, seem to be able to conceive positively only the tendencies toward continuous movement and absolute flows. And thus, in their thought, too, the creative elements and the radical ontology of the production of the social remain insubstantial and impotent. 
Deleuze and Guattari discover the productivity of social reproduction, creative production, production of values, social relations, effects, becomings, but manage to articulate it only superficially and ephemerally as a chaotic, indeterminate horizon marked by the ungraspable event. We can better grasp the relationship between social production and biopower in the work of a group of contemporary Italian Marxist authors who recognize the biopolitical dimensions in terms of the new nature of productive labor and its living development in society, using terms such as mass intellectuality, immaterial labor, and the Marxian concept of general intellect. These analyses set off from two coordinated research projects. The first consists in the analysis of the recent transformations of productive labor and its tendency to become increasingly immaterial. The central role previously occupied by the labor power of mass factory workers in the production of surplus value is today increasingly filled by intellectual, immaterial, and communicative labor power. It is thus necessary to develop a new political theory of value that can pose the problem of this new capitalist accumulation of value at the center of the mechanism of exploitation, and thus perhaps at the center of potential revolt. The second and consequent research project developed by this school consists in the analysis of the immediately social and communicative dimension of living labor in contemporary capitalist society, and thus poses insistently the problem of the new figures of subjectivity in both their exploitation and their revolutionary potential. The immediately social dimension of the exploitation of living and material labor immerses labor in all the relational elements that define the social, but also at the same time activate the critical elements that develop the potential of insubordination and revolt through the entire set of laboring practices. After a new theory of value, then, a new theory of subjectivity must be formulated that operates primarily through knowledge, communication, and language. These analyses have thus reestablished the importance of production within the biopolitical process of the social constitution, but they have also in certain respects isolated it by grasping it in a pure form, refining it on an ideal plane. They have acted as if discovering the new forms of productive forces, immaterial labor, massified intellectual labor, the labor of general intellect, were enough to grasp concretely the dynamic and creative relationship between material production and social reproduction. When they reinsert production into the biopolitical context, they present it almost exclusively on the horizons of language and communication. One of the most serious shortcomings has thus been the tendency among these authors to treat the new laboring practices in biopolitical society only in their intellectual and incorporeal aspects. The productivity of bodies and the value of effect, however, are absolutely central in this context. We will elaborate three primary aspects of immaterial labor in the contemporary economy. The communicative labor of industrial production that has newly become linked in informational networks, the interactive labor of symbolic analysis and the problem solving, and the labor of production and manipulation of effects. This third aspect, with its focus on the productivity of corporeal, the somatic, is an extremely important element in the contemporary networks of biopolitical production. The work of this school and its analysis of general intellect, then, certainly marks a step forward, but its conceptual framework remains too pure, almost angelic. In the final analysis, these new conceptions, too, only scratch the surface of the productive dynamic of the new theoretical framework of biopower. Our task, then, is to build on these partially successful attempts to recognize the potential of biopolitical production, precisely by bringing together coherently the different defining characteristics of the biopolitical context that we have described up to this point, and leading them back to the ontology of production, we will be able to identify the new figure of the collective biopolitical body, which may nonetheless remain as contradictory as it is paradoxical. This body becomes structure not by negating the originary productive forces that animate it, but by recognizing it. It becomes language, both scientific language and social language, because it is a multitude of singular indeterminate bodies that seek relation. It is thus both production and reproduction, structure and superstructure, because it is life in the fullest sense and politics in the proper sense. Our analysis has to descend into the jungle of productive and conflictual determinations that the collective biopolitical body offers us. The context of our analysis thus has to be the very unfolding of life itself, the process of the constitution of the world, of history, 
The analysis must be proposed not through ideal forms, but within a dense complex of experience. Corporations and Communication In asking ourselves how the political and sovereign elements of the imperial machine came to be constituted, we find that there is no need to limit our analysis to, or even focus it on, the established supranational regulatory institutions. The UN organizations, along with the great multi- and transnational finance and trade agencies, the IMF, the World Bank, the GATT, and so forth, all become relevant in the perspective of the supranational judicial constitution only when they are considered within the dynamic of the biopolitical production of world order. The function they had in the old international order, we should emphasize, is not what now gives legitimacy to these organizations. What legitimates them now is rather their newly possible function in the symbology of the imperial order. Outside of the new framework, these institutions are ineffectual. At best, the old institutional framework contributes to the formation and education of the administrative personnel of the imperial machine, the dressage of a new imperial elite. The huge transnational corporations construct the fundamental connective fabric of the biopolitical world in certain important respects. Capital has indeed always been organized with a view toward the entire global sphere, but only in the second half of the 20th century did multinational and transnational industrial and financial corporations really begin to structure global territories biopolitically. Some claim that these corporations have merely come to occupy the place that was held by the various national colonialist and imperial systems in earlier phases of capitalist development from the 19th century European imperialism to the fortest phase of development in the 20th century. This is in part true, but that place itself has been substantially transformed by the new reality of capitalism. The activities of corporations are no longer defined by the imposition of abstract command and the organization of simple theft and unequal exchange. Rather, they directly structure and articulate territories and populations. They tend to make nation-states merely instruments to record the flows of the commodities, monies, and populations that they set in motion. The transnational corporations directly distribute labor power over various markets, functionally allocate resources, and organize hierarchically the various sectors of world production. The complex apparatus that selects investments and directs financial and monetary maneuvers determines the new geography of the world market or really, the new biopolitical structuring of the world. The most complete figure of this world is presented from the monetary perspective. From here, we can see a horizon of values in a machine of distribution, a mechanism of accumulation and a means of circulation, a power and a language. There is nothing, no naked life, no external standpoint that can be posed outside this field permeated by money. Nothing escapes money. Production and reproduction are dressed in monetary clothing. In fact, on the global stage, every biopolitical figure appears dressed in monetary garb. Accumulate, accumulate. This is Moses and the prophets. The great industrial and financial powers thus produce not only commodities, but also subjectivities. They produce agentic subjectivities within the biopolitical context. They produce needs, social relations, bodies, and minds which is to say they produce producers. In the biopolitical sphere, life is made to work for production and production is made to work for life. It is a great hive in which the queen bee continuously oversees production and reproduction. The deeper the analysis goes, the more it finds at increasing levels of intensity, the interlinking assemblages of interactive relationships. One site where we should locate the biopolitical production of order is in the immaterial nexuses of the production of language, communication, and the symbolic that are developed by the communications industries. The development of communications networks has an organic relationship to the emergence of a new world order. It is, in other words, effect and cause, product and producer. Communication not only expresses but also organizes the movement of globalization. It organizes the movement of multiplying and structuring interconnections through networks. It expresses the movement and controls the sense and direction of the imaginary that runs throughout these communicative connections. In other words, the imaginary is guided and channeled within the communicative machine. Of the theories of power of modernity or force to consider transcendent, 
that is external to productive and social relations is here formed inside, imminent to productive and social relations. Mediation is absorbed within the productive machine. The political synthesis of social space is fixed in the space of communication. This is why communications industries have assumed such a central position. They not only organize production on a new scale and impose a new structure adequate to global space, but also make its justification imminent. Power, as it produces, organizes. As it organizes, it speaks and expresses itself as authority. Language, as it communicates, produces commodities, but moreover, creates subjectivities, puts them in relation, and orders them. The communications industries integrate the imaginary and the symbolic within the biopolitical fabric, not merely putting them at the service of power, but actually integrating them into its very functioning. At this point, we can begin to address the question of the legitimation of the new world order. Its legitimation is not born of the previously existing international courts, nor the functioning of the first embryonic supranational organizations, which were themselves created through treaties based on international law. The legitimation of the imperial machine is born, at least in part, of the communications industries, that is, of the transformation of the new mode of production into a machine. It is a subject that produces its own image of authority. This is a form of legitimation that rests on nothing outside itself and is repurposed ceaselessly by developing its own languages of self-validation. One further consequence should be treated on the basis of these premises. If communication is one of the hegemonic sectors of production and acts over the entire biopolitical field, then we must consider communication in the biopolitical context coexistent. This takes us well beyond the old terrain as Jürgen Habermas described it, for example. In fact, when Habermas developed the concept of communicative action, demonstrating so powerfully its productive form and the ontological consequences deriving from that, he still relied on a standpoint outside these effects of globalization, a standpoint of life and truth that could oppose the informational colonization of being. The imperial machine, however, demonstrates that this external standpoint no longer exists. On the contrary, communicative production and the construction of imperial legitimation march hand in hand and can no longer be separated. The machine is self-validating, autopoetic, that is, systemic. It constructs social fabrics that evacuate or render ineffective any contradiction. It creates situations in which, before coercively neutralizing difference, seem to absorb it in an insignificant play of self-generating and self-regulating equilibria. As we have argued elsewhere, any judicial theory that addresses the conditions of post-modernity has to take into account this specifically communicative definition of social production. The imperial machine lives by producing a context of equilibria and or reducing complexities, pretending to put forward a project of universal citizenship and toward this end intensifying the effectiveness of its intervention over every element of the communicative relationship, all the while dissolving identity and history in a completely postmodernist fashion. Contrary to the way many postmodernist accounts would have it, however, the imperial machine, far from eliminating master narratives, actually produces and reproduces them, ideological master narratives in particular, in order to validate and celebrate its own power. In this coincidence of production through language, the linguistic production of reality and the language of self-validation resides a fundamental key to understanding the effectiveness, validity, and legitimation of imperial right. Intervention. This new framework of legitimacy includes new forms and new articulations of the exercise of legitimate force. During its formation, the new power must demonstrate the effectiveness of its force at the same time that the bases of its legitimation are being constructed. In fact, the legitimacy of the new power is in part based directly on the effectiveness of its use of force. The way the effectiveness of the new power is demonstrated has nothing to do with the old international order that is slowly dying away, nor has it much use for the instruments the old order left behind. The deployments of the imperial machine are defined by a whole series of new characteristics, such as the unbounded terrain of its activities, the singularization and symbolic localization of its actions, and the connection of repressive action to all the aspects of the biopolitical structure of society. For lack of a better term, we continue to call these interventions. This is merely a terminological 
and not a conceptual deficiency, for these are not really interventions into independent judicial territories, but rather actions within a unified world by the ruling structure production and communication. In effect, intervention has been internalized and universalized. In the previous section, we refer to both the structural means of intervention that involve the deployments of monetary mechanisms and the financial maneuvers of the transnational field of interdependent productive regimes and interventions in the field of communication and their effects on the legitimation of the system. Here we want to investigate the new forms of intervention that involve the exercise of physical force on the part of the imperial machine over its global territories. The enemies that empire poses today may present more of an ideological threat than a military challenge, but nonetheless the power of empire exercised through force and all the deployments that guarantee its effectiveness are already advanced technologically and solidly consolidated politically. The arsenal of legitimate force for imperial intervention is indeed already vast, and should include not only military intervention, but also other forms, such as moral intervention and judicial intervention. In fact, the empire's power of intervention might be best understood as beginning not directly with its weapons of lethal force, but rather with its moral instruments. What we are calling moral intervention is practiced today by a variety of bodies, including the news media and religious organizations. But the most important may be some of the so-called non-governmental organizations, NGOs, which, precisely because they are not run directly by governments, are assumed to act on the basis of ethical or moral imperatives. The term refers to a wide variety of groups, but we are referring here principally to the global, regional, or local organizations that are dedicated to relief work and the protection of human rights, such as Amnesty International, Oxfam, and Doctors Without Borders. Such humanitarian NGOs are in effect, even if this runs counter to the intentions of the participants, some of the most powerful pacific weapons of the New World Order the charitable campaigns, and the medicant orders of empire. These NGOs conduct just wars without arms, without violence, without borders, like the Dominicans in the late medieval period or the Jesuits at the dawn of modernity. These groups strive to identify universal needs and defend human rights. Through their language and their action, they first define the enemy as privation, in the hope of preventing serious damage, and then recognize the enemy as sin. It is hard not to be reminded here of how in Christian moral theology, evil is first posed as privation of the good, and then sin is defined as culpable negation of the good. Within this logical framework, it is not strange, but rather all too natural, that in their attempts to respond to privation, these NGOs are led to denounce publicly the sinners, or rather, the enemy in properly inquisitional terms. Nor is it strange they leave to the secular wing the task of actually addressing the problems. In this way, moral intervention has become a frontline force of imperial intervention. In effect, this intervention prefigures a state of exception from below, and does so without borders, armed with some of the most effective means of communication and oriented toward the symbolic production of the enemy. These NGOs are completely immersed in the biopolitical context of the constitution of empire. They anticipate the power of its pacifying and productive intervention of justice. It should thus come as no surprise that honest judicial theorists of the old international schools, such as Richard Falk, should be drawn in by the fascination of these NGOs. The NGOs' demonstration of the new order as a peaceful biopolitical context seemed to have blinded these theorists to the brutal effects that moral intervention produces as a prefiguration of world order. Moral intervention often serves as the first act that prepares the stage for military intervention. In such cases, military deployment is presented as an internationally sanctioned police action. Today, military intervention is progressively less a product of decisions that arise out of the old international order or even UN structures. More often, it is dictated unilaterally by the United States, which charges itself with the primary task and then subsequently asks its allies to set in motion a process of armed containment and or oppression of the current enemy of empire. These enemies are most often called terrorists, a crude conceptual and terminological reduction that is rooted in a police mentality. The relationship between prevention and repression is particularly clear in the case of intervention in ethnic conflicts. The conflicts among ethnic groups and the consequent reinforcement of new and or resurrected ethnic identities effectively disrupt the old aggregations based on national political lines.
These conflicts made the fabric of global relations more fluid and, by affirming new identities and new localities, present a more malleable material for control. In such cases, repression can be articulated through preventative action that constructs new relationships, which will eventually be consolidated in peace, but only after new wars, and new territorial and political formations that are functional, or rather, more functional, better adaptable to the constitution of empire. A second example of repression prepared through preventative action is the campaigns against corporate business groups or mafias, particularly those involved in the drug trade. The actual repression of these groups may not be as important as criminalizing their activities and managing social alarm at their very existence in order to facilitate their control. Even though controlling ethnic terrorists and drug mafias may represent the center of the wide spectrum of police control on the part of the imperial power, this activity is nonetheless normal, that is, systemic. The just war is effectively supported by the moral police. Just as the validity of imperial right and its legitimate functioning is supported by the necessary and continuous exercise of police power, it is clear that international or supranational courts are constrained to follow this lead. Armies and police anticipate the courts and pre-constitute the rules of justice the courts must then apply. The intensity of the moral principles to which the construction of the new world order is entrusted cannot change the fact that this is really an inversion of the conventional order of constitutional logic. The active parties supporting the imperial constitution are confident that when the construction of empire is sufficiently advanced, the courts will be able to assume their leading role in the definition of justice. For now, however, although international courts do not have much power, public displays of their activities are still very important. Eventually, a new judicial function must be formed that is adequate to the constitution of empire. Courts will have to be transformed gradually from an organ that simply decrees sentences against the vanquished to a judicial body or system of bodies that dictate and sanction the interrelation among the moral order, the exercise of police action, and the mechanism legitimating imperial sovereignty. This kind of continual intervention then, which is both moral and military, is really the logical form of the exercise of force that follows from a paradigm of legitimation based on a state of permanent exception and police action. Interventions are always exceptional, even though they arise continually. They take the form of police actions because they are aimed at maintaining an internal order. In this way, intervention is an effective mechanism that, through police deployments, contributes directly to the construction of the moral, normative, and institutional order of empire. Royal Prerogatives What were traditionally called the royal prerogatives of sovereignty seem in effect to be repeated and even substantially renewed in the construction of empire. If we were to remain within the conceptual framework of classical, domestic, and international law, we might be tempted to say that a supranational quasi-state is being formed. That does not seem to us, however, an inaccurate characterization of the situation. When the royal prerogatives of modern sovereignty reappear in empire, they take on a completely different form. For example, the sovereign function of deploying military forces was carried out by the modern nation-states and is now conducted by empire. But, as we have seen, the justification for such deployments now rests on a state of permanent exceptions, and the deployments themselves take the form of police actions. Other royal prerogatives, such as carrying out justice and imposing taxes, also have the same kind of liminal existence. We have already discussed the marginal position of judicial authority in the constitutive process of empire, and one could also argue that imposing taxes occupies a marginal position in that it is increasingly linked to specific and local urgencies. In effect, one might say that the sovereignty of empire itself is realized at the margins, where borders are flexible and identities are hybrid and fluid. It would be difficult to say which is more important to empire the center of the margins. In fact, center and margins seem continually to be shifting positions, fleeing any determinate locations. We could even say that the process itself is virtual and that its power resides in the power of the virtual. One can nonetheless object, at this point, that even while being virtual and acting at the margins, the process of constructing imperial sovereignty is in many respects very real. We certainly do not mean to deny that fact. Our claim, rather, is that we're dealing here with a special kind of sovereignty, a discontinuous form of sovereignty that should be considered liminal 
or marginal insofar as it acts in the final instance, a sovereignty that locates its only point of reference in the definitive absoluteness of the power that it can exercise. Empire thus appears in the form of a very high-tech machine. It is virtual, built to control the marginal event, and organized to dominate and, when necessary, intervene in the breakdowns of the system, in line with the most advanced technologies of robotic production. The virtuality and discontinuity of imperial sovereignty, however, do not minimize the effectiveness of its force. On the contrary, those very characteristics serve to reinforce its apparatus, demonstrating its effectiveness in the contemporary historical context and its legitimate force to resolve world problems in the final instance. We are now in the position to address the question whether, on the basis of these new biopolitical premises, the figure of the life of the empire can today be grasped in terms of a judicial model. We have already seen that this judicial model cannot be constituted by the existing structures of international law, even when understood in terms of the most advanced developments of the United Nations and other great international organizations. Their elaborations of an international order could at the most be recognized as a process of transition toward the new imperial power. The constitution of empires being formed neither on the basis of any contractual or treaty-based mechanism, nor through any federative source. The source of imperial normativity is born of a new machine, a new economic, industrial, communicative machine. In short, a globalized biopolitical machine. It thus seems clear that we must look at something other than what has up until now constituted the basis of international order, something that does not rely on the form of right that, in the most diverse traditions, was grounded in the modern system of sovereign nation-states. The impossibility, however, of grasping the genesis of empire and its virtual figure with any of the old instruments of judicial theory, which were deployed in the realist, institutionalist, positivist, or natural right frameworks, should not force us to accept a cynical framework of pure force or some such Machiavellian position. In the genesis of empire, there is indeed a rationality at work that can be recognized not so much in terms of the judicial tradition, but more clearly in the often hidden history of industrial management and the political uses of technology. We should not forget here, too, that proceeding along these lines will reveal the fabric of class struggle and its institutional effects, but we will treat that issue in the next section. This is a rationality that situates us at the heart of biopolitics and biopolitical technologies. If we want to take up again Max Weber's famous three-part formula of the forms of legitimation of power, the qualitative leap that empire introduces into the definition will consist in the unforeseeable mixture of 1. Elements typical of traditional power, 2. An extension of bureaucratic power that is adapted physiologically to the biopolitical context, and three, a rationality defined by the event and by the charisma that rises up as a power of the singularization of the whole and the effectiveness of imperial interventions. The logic that characterizes this neo-Weberian perspective would be functional rather than mathematical and rhizomatic and undulatory rather than inductive or deductive. It would deal with the management of linguistic sequences as sets of machinic sequences of denotation and at the same time of creative, colloquial, and irreducible innovation. The fundamental object of the imperial relations of power interpret is a productive force of the system, the new biopolitical, economic, and institutional system. The imperial order is formed not only on the basis of its powers of accumulation and global extension, but also on the basis of its capacity to develop itself more deeply to be reborn, and to extend itself throughout the biopolitical latticework of world society. The absoluteness of imperial power is a complementary term to its complete imminence to the ontological machine of production and reproduction, and thus to the biopolitical context. Perhaps, finally, this cannot be represented by a judicial order, but it nonetheless is an order, or an order defined by its virtuality, its dynamism, and its functional inconclusiveness. The fundamental norm of legitimation will thus be established in the depths of the machine, at the heart of social production. Social production and judicial legitimation should not be conceived as primary and secondary forces, nor as elements of the base and superstructure, but should be understood rather in a state of absolute parallelism 
and intermixture, coextensive throughout biopolitical society, an empire and its regime of biopower, economic production, and political constitution tend increasingly to coincide. 